too. Watch out. Watch out. Oh. Hey, and welcome back. So it's been a little while since I recorded, um, and I wanted to throw something together to show some of the most recent launches. Um, I have been working a lot behind the scenes on some of the software and upgrades to the whole airframe, and I think it's pretty good to come in and summarize some of that. All right, so hopefully I have enough cord here to have a functional microphone, but it's been a while since I've produced a video on Rocketry. But behind the scenes, I've actually been doing quite a lot. Um, overall, the last flight went pretty well, but there were a lot of issues with the guidance and nav system. Um, in previous flights, in flight four and all flights before that, I actually had pretty good orientation tracking during the course of the rocket's flight. Um, this is basically because it wasn't rolling very much. In my flight software, I've made a lot of assumptions on small angles, and those kind of caught up with me on the last one. So that angle on takeoff um, kind of comes from the roll coupling of different axes. Um, I'm only using Euler angles, so you're able to create a situation called gimbal lock. So when you have a gimbal lock scenario, you've rolled and I'm adding that axis to the other ones. Um, and it kind of throws off everything and it basically leads to you having a bad time. So for the next flight, um, everything basically has to be redone. So that means new orientation determination system. We can't use Euler, which worked okay for some of the previous flights and it can get you by but not being able to control the roll is a real downside um, on other vehicles where you had full control like three axis control like a drone uh, you can basically get away with this because you can keep yourself in check but for a rocket where you only have two axes of control it really doesn't end well So let's get into how we make things work. Um, Quaternion is a really complex subject. Um, I studied it in college, and even then I still really don't fully understand it. Um, implementing it, there are some libraries out there. I got a lot of help, which allowed me to kind of shortcut some of those pitfalls. But overall, the way it avoids gimbal lock is it takes a 3D space and it adds like a fourth gimbal angle to everything. And it transforms between 4D space and 3D space. And it kind of cuts the corner and creates this like in-between axis of rotation. It's a really, really slick way of doing things. It actually predates the way we kind of learn most vector notation and everything. Uh, there's a lot of great videos. I'm gonna link one uh, with this graphic here because it's going to explain it way better than I ever could. But overall, it's a way of interpreting orientation. And the better you interpret orientation, the better you can feed it to the gimbal, and the better you can feed it to the gimbal, the more you can stay on track in flight. So after a ton of software debugging, I was able to get to a point where I could actually get good data out of the orientation system. It's taking the three gyros on the rocket and some of the accelerometer and kind of passing them in and figuring out what the orientation is overall. Um, this is a process that, you know, took a lot of fiddling because my axes might not have matched the um, axes in the library I was using, but overall, we got there. You can really tell that things are working because the axes as I roll the rocket no longer are coupled. Previously, when I would go 90 degrees, roll the rocket, and then return it to vertical, all the axes 
angles would be way off. I'm saying axes a lot. As you would roll the vehicle, it would create kind of cross coupling and you would end up with an angle that your orientation would basically be off by some margin of error. Um, not being able to account for how these angles kind of work in unison with each other is a big source of why you use quaternion versus Euler angles. There are workarounds for Euler angles, but in most cases, it's usually better to use quaternion. It's actually used in uh, graphics processors to move like every single polygon on whatever 3D model that you have ever, um, just because it's so good at not screwing up the orientation. So going through the whole software update, I added this whole library for Quaternion. I restructured basically everything so that there's a parallel set of uh, flight modes that are able to run kind of on top of each other. And it overall made the code a lot better uh, to understand, at least from my perspective. Um, it sped up the loop rate significantly to where I was having much, much higher uh, frequency. So that cycle time of the loop, calculating what the angle is, sending it to the TVC mechanism, and then executing that maneuver um, is so much faster. And the less time you have between executing those movements, the better. Just because at my scale, the rockets are very small, so time is very, very critical to staying on course. Um, if I don't do it fast enough, I'm not gonna fly straight. I made a couple upgrades in how I do my test stand. Uh, originally, I use a single propeller from a drone running at basically full throttle uh, to push and mimic the force of a rocket motor on the gimbal. Um, this kind of doesn't cut it, and I was pushed into fixing things by my motor and ESC on the original uh, test rig just dying. So I had to switch to a new system, which we should see more of in the future on a lander project I'm working on. Um, this is a contra-rotating propeller, so it has two motors stacked on top of each other with a common shaft inside of each other that allow two propellers to rotate opposite. Um, it's really, really awesome because there's no torque and it's probably the best mimic of a rocket motor that I can have without actually burning one. Um, this, uh, this setup is much, much stronger than my old one and it's able to mimic the really high thrust of some of the higher thrust motors that I'm looking at flying. Um, one of which is the Estes F-15, which we are going to fly on in this video, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The whole software rewrite meant I had to recalibrate and reprogram all the PID gains and figure out how to retune the rocket, but I've been through this enough before. After a bit of debugging, uh, I was able to figure out some of the pitfalls between switching over orientation libraries from my old one that I wrote myself, which was pretty bad, uh, to this new one, which is great. Um, and I have to thank uh, Perry from Peregrine Developments. He basically kind of founded this whole library and is a much better software guy than I am. So his software now runs as a component of mine and it means I'm gonna have better orientation going forward. And I think I can do a lot more with roll programs and maintaining orientation as the rocket tumbles. Uh, this would be really important if you're trying to land. I had a few workarounds with my old code, but this is just a better way to do it. And overall, I think um, it, it has a better path forward for me. With everything ready to go, I was able to load the mission patch onto the vehicle and we were out to the launch site. Um, it's been a little rainy, so it took a while to get a launch window to be able to fly. But when I did, it was a nice afternoon and I think the results for the powered ascent really speak for themselves.
too. Watch out. Watch out. Oh. Oh, God. No. So if we just look at the part going upwards, things go really, really well. And I'm pretty happy with that. That's, the, uh, that's where the, the kind of good news ends. Uh, it seems between changing over code formats, I somehow broke something inside the software that allows it to open its parachute. Which sucks. And as a result, a uh, total loss of vehicle, uh, for the most part. Um, the avionics inside are fine, but the airframe has to be completely redone. So I'm working through that, and I'm actually doing an entire series for patrons only where it shows how these rockets are assembled, and then it has links to all the different files that I use to 3D print and skin them so that they look the part. Um, the new vehicle is already built. Uh, this is the old one here. Um, a little worse for wear, but you know, it's kind of nice being able to start from clean slate on a few of the bits uh, because guess what? It ends up being much nicer and you fix the problems that you made on the last one. If Perry hadn't done enough to really help me out here, uh, he ended up going back through some of my software and double checking some of the problems I made. One of which was the data logging timer, which completely shut off the data logging uh, in a debug feature that I had not removed in testing. Uh, I spent so long on the test stand that I kind of got used to how the software looked and I forgot to remove a little commented section that told myself, hey, you need to remove this before you go fly. Did not listen, but after the fact, I found it and it seems to be working just fine. Um, currently, I'm in a whole test campaign to figure out and fix all the issues that I had on the last flight and carry it forward so that I'm ready to fly a certain orange rocket, which is going to be much more complex and is actually getting very close to being ready to fly again. A couple of the other issues where I left a lot of the debug information in to be able to work on the rocket on the test stand, and as such, I may have inerted it before even flying it. Um, I tried to do a lot to minimize some of the pitfalls that I had before, where some of the pyrotechnics went off on the pad, but I may have been a little too conservative in accidentally preventing the rocket from firing any of those pyrotechnics. Ever. But next flight, I think we're going to have a really great mission. I've been doing a lot of uh, hardware and loop testing in the meantime, where the flight computer is running previous data where it's able to look at its altitude from one of the previous flights, load it in in place of the altimeter, and I can kind of see what it does in real time. Uh, it's like running it inside of itself, but it's for all intents and purposes doing the same thing it would do if it was actually in flight. So yeah, that's about it. Um, I am pretty excited to announce my whole new series on showing off uh, how I build these. I'm trying to do one for SLS, one for uh, Spica, and one for Falcon 9. Uh, I have the first episode of that up on how I build my TVC gimbal with the compliant joints. Uh, I've been trying to 
add value to, to people who support me because I really appreciate it and it makes all of this possible. So overall, I think uh, between this flight and the next flight, I'm gonna be able to fix the problems rather easily. I've already fixed most of them in software that I've been able to identify and that Perry's helped me identify. So coming up, I think we're gonna have a really, really great launch. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.